Yeah, so this uh, webinar today is a follow-on of one that we did two weeks ago where we did a, um, an introduction or reintroduction um, to smart taps to explain a little how, they, how they're being used, shared some success stories. And some of the feedback from that um, session was people wanted to know more about how they could actually implement these projects uh, in a practical way. So what I want to do today is focus a little more on how you can design the networks. So how you work out how many dispensers you would install for a given population. Look at some of the return on investment figures. So look at how we can calculate the costs of implementing such a network. Look again at some different applications and uses. Um, I'll try and do this quite quickly. So I'll try and get this in kind of 30 to 40 minutes. So we have good time for questions and answers afterwards. So we are um, using the GoToWebinar platform, platform today. So um, everybody's on mute. Uh, we have um, currently nearly yeah, nearly 100 people on the call. So it's best if one person speaks with that many people. Um, you will see there's a question box on your panel there. If you have any questions as I'm going through, th please type them in. Uh, I'll try and answer as many as I can while I'm talking. Um, any that I can't answer in the flow of the presentation will pick up at the end as we have in the other webinars. This seems to work quite well. We're recording the webinar today, so if there's anything that you miss, um, another point you want to go back on, you'll be able to look at the webinar uh, recording later. Uh, and you will have a link uh, tomorrow morning, uh, tomorrow about the same time as now, you'll receive a, a link to the recorded presentation. The other thing I'll mention is um, all of the uh, webinars we've done so far so I think we've done nine or so in the last uh, couple of weeks uh, all of these are on PartnerNet so if you um, obviously most of you are PartnerNet users there is a webinar button on the home page now looks like a little blue TV you'll see on the uh, home page there you can look at the uh, webinars and if you've missed anything you can go back and, and run through them share them with your colleagues etc good so um, let me let me just talk for a second about the sustainability word because sustainability is used um, an awful lot but when we start to think about water networks and implementing water for communities um, yeah and also for irrigation we have to think about uh, a, a few different types of sustainability so particularly when we, we're talking about drinking water for people we have to think is this socially sustainable so is the solution that we're going to put in does it fit with the people does it fit with the local context um, is it sustainable socially after a donor or government walks away from the local um, community will, will this be sustained we have to obviously look at economic sust sustainability so anything that we install is is this fit for the future so will it will it look after itself economically um, after the first project has been put in place. I think we all know of uh, many examples of systems and solutions that have been put in place, particularly in rural communities, where either a donor or government or local agency walks away from the project, something goes wrong, and then there isn't the money locally to repair it, to sustain it. So we'll talk a bit more about the economic sustainability. Then, of course, all solutions need to be operationally sustainable. I have to have operations and maintenance built in. Again, that usually involves collecting money, training people to make sure that anything you install is operationally sustainable. So fixable, yeah, maintainable, is serviced, etc. And of course, environmental sustainability must come in as well. So we must think about is a solution we're installing environmentally sustainable? And we have to do this for a few reasons. Um, if we go to the first reason, of course, we, we need to look after and love our planet. This is important. But secondly, um, envirom in, environmental requirements um, are increasingly high on the agenda of getting uh, projects approved, whether this is um, local rules approval or whether it's um, financial approval. Having environmental sustainability is, of course, very important. So wherever your thoughts are on the environment, whether it's a 
primary uh, primary focus of yours or whether it's a secondary one, it's still really important in, in making sure these projects are successful. So we'll come back to sustainability a bit later. Let, let's move on to the technology, the um, the scoping of technology and the pricing of technology. Let's get into to that detail. So just um, so everybody has it in their mind, let's uh, just make sure we all know what we're talking about. And if we're talking about a typical sustainable water solution, it would look something like this. So we would have um, a water source. This could, could be a borehole, could, could be water treatment, could even be piped water from the city. So this could be any, any water supply that we're going to put into our network. Actually, what's interesting at the moment is if we look at the smart tap deployments, uh, I would say probably at the moment, one third of them are on solar pumps. One third of them are actually taking uh, municipal water, so piped piped water from um, a water company, and one third of them are on traditional electric pumps with a mixture of diesel and grid connections. So smart taps are being deployed really across all sorts of water networks. And of course, that makes sense because the dispenser itself is only a way of collecting revenue at the point of use. So it's a, it's a think of it as a money collection device. Um, yes, it's solar powered. Yes, it's great off grid, but actually it's quite at home being installed in a city or anywhere else that where, where there's a need for um, revenue collection. So we have our water supply and whether this is coming from a solar pump in this example here, uh, from an elevated tank or from a city pipe, it doesn't matter. All we're doing is taking a pipe into the water dispenser. So we would typically then have water dispensers, the smart taps located around the community. So it makes sense that you distribute the uh, water dispensers so they're nearer to the people that use them. Again, I'll come on to this a bit later. There's some really good, good, good proof points and thinking to have here. And each user then has a token, a tag, an NFC device, this little token that you can see here. Uh, and this is the de device that allow this is the um, device that allows them to collect water from any of the dispensers. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about a a sustainable system, something like this. Just quickly talk about the operation. So again, we have this in our mind. If we have more questions on this, I'll do them at the end. But I want to focus on designing the networks today rather than operations. Uh, there's a, some really good videos um, and information on our website and on PartnerNet that really explain the detailed operation of the units. So I don't want to spend so much time on that today. That's that's good homework for you to do if you have questions there. So if we talk about the components, we have the water dispenser here. We have the the tag, and this this is uh, we think think of this as a wallet. So the tag itself holds the information about the user says this is Adrian's token. It says how much credit the user has. And this allows our system to work completely offline without network connectivity. So the tag here itself is holding the information about the user. This means the user can go to any water dispenser. Again, within within the network of water dispensers, it's, it's still controlled. Um, they can go to any dispenser within their network and collect water. Uh, the tags are then topped up by a water seller. So over here, you can see some pointing there on the smartphone app here. This is a local water seller or an agent um, that that then tops up the tags for the users. So they come with cash or mobile money payments. They have their token top, their, their tag topped up with credit, much like you would top up a, a SIM card. And then they can use any of the water dispensers and then all the data across the system is is collected together and sent into the the cloud so you can see all of the water operations online so you can see how much water has been sold today you can see how much water has been dispensed today etc cetera, etc cetera. so as you would expect this is great at collecting money and it's also great at collecting data so you really have a good understanding of what's happening within the network Good. So I'm going to I'm going to keep that really short there, and let's let's focus on now how we would design networks. So 
So the um, the basic questions we need to do need to have when we are first looking at installing a a, a, a water dispenser network are these simple four questions. So we'll know how many people there are in the community that's being served. It's really useful to know how many families there are. So total population and then how many families, so how many family units there are. The average water per day that people are buying or the total water uh, that's, that, that the um, water system is designed for. One of those two numbers is, is very useful. And it's really useful also to understand the pressure of the water supply. So is this very low pressure? Is it high pressure? Is it normal pressure? It's, it's really good to understand what the kind of pressure and flows are like uh, in the network. So if we have really poor pressure and really poor flow, we should understand that. Uh, and this is simply about planning the number of dispensers. So to maybe illustrate, um, to illustrate this, let's let's throw some numbers in. Um, then we can work through an example, and this might make things re really easy to see. So if we take a a, a community here, we say we've got 1,200 people, and those 1,200 people are spread across 200 families. So we have six people per family, and the average water per day that this community uh, is is using is 15 liters. So 15 liters per person, and the pressure of the water supply across this this network. It's all modern pipe work. It's pretty good, and it's it's averaging about one bar, so 14 psi. So it's you know reasonably good um, pressure across the network. Now the smart taps will work right down from 0 0.1 bar um, right through to three or four bar. Um, three or four bar is not very user friendly, but you know, one one bar is a really good one and a half bar. This this kind of pressure is really good, good user experience and uh, good flow. We'll look at that in, in a minute or two. So first first thing we can do with these numbers is we can just work out how much water per day are we looking at. So it's 1,200 people by 15 liters, so 18,000 liters, 18 cubic meters per day is the amount of water we're looking to give. To, to this community. So this is what we're looking to deliver into the community. And we can see, so we want to deliver eight, 18 cubic meters and we have one bar of pressure. So we're now going to have a look at our pressure versus flow chart. So again, this is included in the, the, the technical data of the products. So we can see here uh, um, one bar we will be getting 34 liters per minute so we can see there we have one bar of pressure each dispenser will deliver 34 liters per minute okay so let's take those two sets of figures so we have our 18 cubic meters and we have let's assume that we each dispenser is working for about six hours a day. So they can work for six hours times 60 minutes times 34 liters. That gives us a, a, a 12,000 liters per day per dispenser figure. Again, depending on, yeah, depending on different communities, we might lower the six to five, we might lower it to four even sometimes if we want really small queuing times. Most people want to optimize the yeah, the, num the number of, uh, minimize the number of dispensers for cost reasons, of course. Um, so this is, I would say, uh, probably a, a good planning number. For more comfortable situation, I might even get out to four hours of operation per day. Remember, the dispenser can work 24 hours a day, so it will change the collection habits a little of, of people using it. The dispenser um, has a battery inside so it's so it works 24 hours a day so this kind of does smooth out the collection times of water so if we plan for you know four five six hours somewhere in that in that range that's a that's a good planning number so if we took six hours we could see at, at one bar then we would get 12,000 liters per day dispensed 
So if we kind of take out 18,000 and we know that one dispenser can do 12,000, if we put two dispensers in for this community, that would give good user coverage. So again, it's important to keep the queuing times down because then people are much happier and actually buy more water if they have shorter queues. Um, and yeah, that gives us a, re a reasonable coverage there. So we could, at, uh, at six hours, we would deliver 20, 24 cubic meters a day. We need 18. So again, that, that gives us a good figure. It's probably we're at four and a half uh, productive hours per dispenser per day, which is going to give us small queues. So again, you have to play around with these a little bit. Um, we've got some planning tools we can look at as well, but just doing this kind of on a on a piece of paper is fairly simple. Just working that calculation through, you can see that for 1,200 people here, we're going to look at um, two dispensers to give us reasonably good coverage, small queues. And then the tags themselves, we're going to use 200 tags because you don't need one per person. You would typically use one tag per family. So that's why the family number becomes important. If we um, if we give one tag per family or sell one tag per family, um, this is this is this is the correct way to do it. Good. So we kind of have a first shopping list for our 1,200 people there, and I'll talk about costs or prices here because um, if I ignore it, I know we'll get lots of questions. So let's um, get those get those questions in now. So I've put some list prices up here. The smart tap, tap dispensers themselves are a uh, thousand again euros dollars is not much difference at the moment. But if we talk about a thousand dollars each, and the um, the the tags two hundred tags is about a thousand dollars as well. So if we looked at uh, installation and some ancillary, uh, you know, just pipe connection parts, etc., then you're probably talking about three and a half thousand dollars, something like that, to install two units. And I have to put my two stars on here, of course, because um, the prices will vary country to country. Um, some some countries, this is, you know, water products, um, solar products, etc., have zero duties. In other countries, unfortunately, sadly, we still see almost 50% import duties. So this will change country to country, whether there's VAT or no VAT or low VAT on these kind of products is, is completely mixed as well. So pe some countries can see much higher prices. So there are some, um, I'll, I'll just mention that. The other thing, of course, um, these are list prices. So we're not talking about any, your, your discounts as a partner or project discounts for for larger projects and things so these prices yeah let, let's use them as a as a talking point for our numbers today but of course um you, you must look realistically locally and at the size of projects to to come up with a real price uh i would say this is uh this is this is a good a good middle price to use um for a customer Good. So we have about yeah three three and a half thousand dollars in in for two dispensers installed. And quickly look at what's coming in the box with the smart tap, just so we we don't miss anything here. So with each smart tap, we do have a custom PV module. So this this PV module that you can see here on a on a very short pole for the picture. Um, the module itself and the custom bracket comes with it. There's then a, a cable connected to that PV module, and the cable then goes down and connects into the smart tap. So this charges a battery that goes inside. The battery isn't supplied, um, but it's a standard MP7 uh, battery that's available everywhere in the world, typically for uh, $15. So it's a, a, a very a very low cost, very widely available battery that's used in lots of applications from small electric bikes to um, fire alarms to security systems. Um, all of these applications use it. So it's a very widely known battery. So the unit comes with uh, with its PV module, with the, the cable, with the bracket to connect the PV module. 
um, with a silicon delivery hose. Um, so it has a, a nice gray silicon hose on it. Um, unlike this picture here, it's a, it's a gray silicon hose. It's really good quality. And we have our Bluetooth communication built in. This allows for data collection and sending. Uh, all of that comes included with the SmartTap itself. So there's no extras to add on to it. So we know what we're kind of getting in the box. Um, let's now think about the revenue side of financial planning. And what, what I just wanted to throw up first of all is let's consider let's consider that we are in a situation where we're delivering water already to a community. So many of the projects actually are implementing revenue collection for the first time. So it may be that the county water organization or a central government function or a local charity or the local community itself are providing water to the rest of the community. And they could be doing this either free of charge, so the water points are just there and open for everyone to use, which is not very sustainable. Or it could be um, that they have a, a, a person standing there who collects money from people using the facility. So people come along with, with their jerry can, they pay a small amount of cash to a uh, someone standing in front of the tap who lets them collect water. So these these different models exist. And so all I wanted to do is put in your mind what the return on investment of the the smart tap would be based on the prices we just talked about. So if we look at this table here, if we look at the bottom, and let's start let's start at the the bottom where we're talking about charging half a cent per liter for water. Yeah, so this means that the each dispenser would would collect um, sixty one dollars per day. Yeah, so of course that that pays for that unit in less than one month. If we go right to the, you know, up to point zero zero one cents. Yeah, so we talk we're talking about that you get um, ten liters for one dollar cent, we're still talking about five months ROI to pay for the infrastructure here. So in terms of collection of revenue, very affordable for the, for the community compared to the cost of the collection device, yeah, the revenue collection device, the water dispensers here, the smart tap, um, this is a very, very affordable thing to install. So people have in their mind some of the water dispenser systems from 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 years ago that were really expensive, really complicated to install. This is so simple, so quick to install, no complicated co complicated back end configuration. It's all working out the box. Whether you have one dispenser, one thousand or ten thousand, still very simple and scalable. But you look at an individual dispenser here, the return on on the investment for it is very very fast so very affordable very small numbers that you can see there for pricing this out so let's think a little bit more about that topic so if we think about a situation where there is no revenue currently so this could be either a water utility that simply gives water to a community because they don't have any other any way of collecting revenue this is quite common it's not uncommon to see um, professional uh, county water organizations, local water organizations, rural water organizations, where 70% of the water they deliver has no revenue associated. Of course, if there's a meter into a house somewhere, if there's a metered connection, there is a chance of collecting revenue. Where it's a public water point, which is still serving the vast majority of people in rural areas, uh, there is no revenue opportunity, no opportunity to collect revenue unless there's a person sitting there collecting money. So anywhere where there's high non-revenue water, you don't even need an ROI calculation. You need the figures from the from the sheet before. It's uh, very, very simple. My second point would be that the smart taps don't have pockets. Um, and what I really mean by this is where we do have people collecting money. 
whether it's on behalf of a community or whether it's on on behalf of a company um you know there is really a high amount of fraud human fraud in collecting cash locally from people so firstly most water to public water points isn't metered very accurately secondly the people that are selling the water there have two pockets one maybe that they get the water money back to the boss and the other one that they maybe take home and we've got really good evidence of this where we see where we change a human managed water system out to a smart tap managed water system we see a doubling of revenue with the same amount of water sold so really this means that there's 50 percent of cash losses um, in the system of course as soon as we move to this this becomes then completely transparent every single liter that's sold is accounted for we know exactly who sold it we know exactly how much money they need to pay back so this this really is fully accountable end to end. Rural water is expensive. Um, yeah, if you look at what people are really paying for water, um, whether they're buying it in, in packets or bottles or jerry cans from local vendors or trucked water coming in, rural water is incredibly expensive. It's not, it's not unusual to be paying some, somewhere around $5 cents per litre. If we think of all the sachet and bagged water that goes on, it's all of, you know, often of questionable quality anyway, but it's put into a bag and sold and, and lots of countries are selling sachet water. And again, typically this is three, four, five cents per litre. If we compare that, that's completely off of the chart that we had on the last page. We're talking about 10 times the numbers we were using there and people are, are having to buy the drinking water this way so implementing a smart tap um, in implementing solar pumps really is 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 a very economical way of delivering water to these communities with a guaranteed revenue stream afterwards so very investable for both private and public banks this is a very investable thing to do the other thing to pick up on just just is as soon as you have use someone using the tag and not going to a free collection point you actually reduce waste massively so you see going from a public water point typically with you know lots of lots of uh, water ending up on the floor the tap stands gushing water away um, with the hygiene problems around this actually as soon as you in, implement this this uh, smart tap you see people taking the last drop of water that they pay for it's almost like filling a filling your car with fuel when you tap the, the the pipe at the end of filling it even though it's one drop extra going into your fuel tank people treat water the same way as soon as they're paying for it when it's not free um they they, they treat it very carefully and of course, the other thing we can do in our financial plan, and this is really important for the social planning, is we can also um, implement, uh, for instance, a free daily water allowance for every user. So each family maybe gets 10 litres per day for free, and then they pay for water on top of their 10 litres. So we can implement all of the um, social safety nets for communities with daily entitlements, with special allowances for vulnerable families for um, people that have got health problems extra allowances so all these things can be integrated into the tag very easily so it's not just a, a simple this is a, a a simple money collection device actually it can be used quite in quite innovative ways to protect people in the community so if people are saying ah, we can't implement this because it needs to be free because we're poor yeah absolutely we need to make sure everyone is is no one's left behind here we need to make sure they're included but what we what we don't need to do is give unlimited free water to everybody so we can draw some lines on usage on free uses versus paid usage and the technology lets us do all of these things good and also on partnernet we have um, very detailed um, planning spreadsheets. So we have some spreadsheets that allow full ROI calculations. Again, I won't go into this in too much detail, 
but this really goes through um, the planning, the financial planning for a system, looking at uh, payback times, looking at what price water should be sold for to cover off investments. And you can use this for implementing either a very simple add-on to an existing system right through to um, really going and drilling boreholes and installing tanks and infrastructure, the whole the whole thing. So this can, uh, yeah, allow you to build, yeah, relatively complex business models um, and model out what, what you want to do over time. So this is a, a useful planning tool that's available on PartnerNet. Good. So let's um, let's talk a little bit more. We talked a bit about the economics there and how we plan. Let's talk a little bit more about some of the other sustainability points when we're planning rollouts of uh, networks. We've got some good questions coming in, so keep them coming in, and I'll, I'll try and answer them as I go through, and we'll pick the others up at the end. So let's think about if we're going to implement uh, a new water system of any kind, what do we need to think about? in terms of social planning. So the first thing uh, I think is really important is if you're moving from a scenario where there's free water being given out, given out and you are now moving to a paid model, your beneficiaries suddenly become customers. So when people are paying, of course, they immediately have a higher expectation. This means that you can't have a situation where the water runs out in the afternoon. If it's free, you can you can do what you want. If it's uh, paid for, then people have an expectation of service. So this has been this is really important that you think about this. Start to think about the people you're serving, not as you know they're lucky they get free water. To these are important customers of ours, and we need to give them a really good service. So this is a uh, something you have to think about. It might mean, for instance, you have to install bit bigger water tanks to make sure you have water throughout the day. The great thing is you're going to spread the delivery of water through the day. So again, if you're if you're bringing together smart taps with solar pumps, you can even do some innovative things on tariffs to make afternoon tariff cheaper than morning, these kind of things. So we can we can we can think about how how we use technology to overcome some infrastructure challenges. We want to think about what what service you're displacing so again this becomes really important if you are bringing water to a new a community you have to assume it's obvious that they're going to currently be getting their water from somebody or from somewhere and you're going to bring in a new service so if there's a, an existing water seller there that's uh, trucking in water every day or um, serving the community in a different way and you're going to bring in a service which is much better and much cheaper, the person doing it's not going to be very happy. So, of course, what you want to do is bring those people into the solution, hopefully make them water sellers, make them part of the new solution, and not just think they'll go away. Uh, of course, we, we've seen, um, not, not particularly on the smart taps, but on uh, solar pumps, we've seen solar pumps vandalized by people that have, are upset that you're now introducing a service where they were selling trucked water for three times the price. So we need to think about who's being displaced, who's who's going to suffer from the new good service that goes in, in place. And also we need to think about the social structures that exist in the community. So can we work with the mosque? Can we work, work with the churches? Can we work with local water committees, schools even? All of the social structures that exist in many of these communities, we need to think about how we can work with them to implement um, the, the new services. Again, we've done this really successfully in a couple of countries now where there's a, an education program with uh, the, the communities themselves before the service starts. So this is something that starts ahead of the rollout of large projects. You're bringing in the schools, you're bringing in the community leaders of, of all types and you're explaining to them what's going to happen how it's going to work what the benefits are to the community and again make them ambassadors for the service and this is really good to help uh, the rollout 
yeah we also then need to think about the operational planning so who are the water sellers in the community going to be so there might be people that are naturally suited to this role it could be people that are selling water at the moment they could be employees of the water company you're going to they could be members of a local water committee people that want to be champions of the service and they want to be the interface to the customers in the community so they could be people you employ could be employed by the the customer or they could be independent again think of the people that are selling um, the M-Pesa agents there's no reason or local shopkeepers could also sell water credits alongside the other goods that they sell some technical um, so, sorry some operational planning things to talk to the customer about so we have a couple of models operating um, sometimes they um, the water sellers are have to pre-buy all of the water they sell to customers and sometimes the uh, owner of the infrastructure will say i'll pre-finance my water sellers for a day or a week because the money trans the, because the transactions for water are completely transparent you can even say great i'll give you ten thousand liters of water to sell and then when you come back with the money i'll give you another ten thousand because it's it's credits in the system yeah so we can work different models here and the the systems behind it will support either prepaid or pre-financed um, credits out into the system and we also need to think then about um, repairs and service so the pro the smart dispenser has been designed really for very simple um, repair and operation this means we don't need to have a highly trained pump technician we can try train um, yeah less skilled technicians and obviously less cost um, technicians to service the water dispensers it's very simple you can even see we're to the point of having color-coded boards for even low literacy technicians in, in in some instances to make things really easy so all of the parts are available at um, and based on our normal premise that you can buy any of our products for you can buy it as spare parts or buy it as a complete unit for the same price so we don't have a premium on our spare parts pricing so everything's available Tip, typical technician training for this product is two hours so we can really train a technician to do every task in two hours and this of course means you then don't have to have your best um, solar pump uh, installation technicians service technicians deployed on smart taps because of the volume of them um, then you can have a, a, a lower grade of technician working on these uh, very easily you can even train um, local people in, in communities that have got high high numbers of the units um, can be trained to do the ser any servicing locally so we are only talking about um, working on them at point of failure there's no regular servicing to do so there's no parts that need replacing or servicing um, as a matter of course it will only be where there is a some kind of failure so let's think a little bit about um, where we would put the dispensers in a community we um, we have now really good evidence that we from from the installations we have and the data we have that tells us that if we can get a dispenser within 200 meters uh, of somebody's house this this is this means you know putting them 400 meters apart um, this increases the visits and increases the sales so if we really can get uh, the community not walking two kilometers to to a dispenser but walking with 200 meters so every 400 meters we install them then this is this is really really a good way it changes the behavior of water collection from collecting you know 20 liter jerry cans every time down to people then will come with just a a small jug or a saucepan to collect water when they need it this is good for health it means there's a lot much less water sitting around all day um, and actually for consumption the consumption of water also goes up 
separating the dispensers out. So sometimes you think for a project, uh, for, for cost reasons, um, putting them all together in one place is really nice. Of course, separating them to reduce cross-contamination of yeah, diseases, viruses um, is a good idea. Uh, I think with the current climate, this has never been truer that, uh, you know, separating people, not having everyone going to one point in a community, letting people to go to multiple points is is really sensible and reduces lot, lots of problems. And of course, the last small technical thing is because this um, is solar powered, you can see on this picture here, actually, the small module there on top of the tap stand is powering the unit. Um, we want to make sure this isn't shaded all day. Two or three hours of 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 light on it a day is is normally fine for charging. It's not uh, it's 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 got quite a lot of uh, capacity there. Yeah, and I want to talk about real time or not versus non real time data collection. And maybe I just have to introduce this a little bit for you. So, um, as I mentioned at the beginning. We design this system always to work offline. And the reason we did that is when we assessed the market three years ago, we saw that lots of people were always making sure every unit has GSM connection, it must have real time data. And this meant that people designed their systems to rely on GSM. So this means they rely on using a cellular connection to check people's credits etc from what we knew about 20 years with solar pumps um, getting a cellular connection reliably and get, having that connection reliably 24 hours a day is actually not so easy and whether this is in an urban situation with lots of buildings or where it's in a rural situation when we are yeah not in high population areas this becomes a challenge so we said when we designed this system it should always work everything every feature should work offline and this is why we decided that rather than using our tag as an identifier we would use the tag as a wallet so that all the data is held on that tag this allows us to work completely offline of course we can sync the data online but it allows us to work offline we can of course connect to all of our devices online but what we've seen now is 90% of the solutions that have been deployed have actually been running their dispensers, the dispensers themselves, not connected via GSM. And the reason is for this, the information that's really important to you is the financial transaction. So the, the, the thing that's really important is, is how much, how much um, credit did I sell today? How much credit, you know, how much money did I get in today? How much credit did I sell today? This is information you need real time. Actually, looking at the profile of water collection from one dispenser is something you want maybe at the end of the day, maybe at the end of the week. It's something that's not that interesting to say, hey, Joe has just collected two and a half liters of water from dispenser number 127 is not actually very interesting operational data. So what, what we've done is what I would call at the moment on 90% of the systems now is Uberized data collection. The great thing about water dispensers is there are hundreds of people around them during the day. And what you can do with, with, with this is either the agent who's selling water locally, um, even, a, even a member of the, the community can do this, where they can pull the data using an app and push the data to the cloud using a standard cell phone. So this is something that can be done um, once an hour, once a day, once a week, once a month, it doesn't matter. Yeah, so you can collect the data at any point. All the data stored in the smart tap itself. We're storing you know, up to three years of data here inside the, the smart tap. So all the transactional data of exactly who collected water is then pushed to the cloud, but you means you don't have to have a live connection in that device all the time so this is this is positive from two two points of view as i mentioned that data is not really very interesting real time it's really interesting to have maybe once a week but not real time what's um 
what you do by not having to have a radio and a SIM card in every device is firstly, you reduce the cost. So cost of the unit comes down. Secondly, the cost of operation, i.e. not having to have a SIM card comes down. Third thing is you don't have to worry about topping up data contracts, making sure that someone looks after the SIM card in each device to make sure it still has credit on it, etc. goes away. And the last and very important thing is, as you know, the whole world is going through technology revolutions with, um, with uh, cellular communication. So from 2G to 3G to 4G and now to 5G, we're seeing, yeah, this is, this is really not even um, location dependent. We're seeing uh, changes happening quite quickly where we expected 3G to be around a long time. 3G is disappearing really quickly and going to 4G. Now, 2G is outlasting 3G. So if, if we, um, by installing a, a, a radio modem in every unit, you are really building a legacy problem. Whereas the dispensers will be happily working in five years time, the chances are the cellular radios in them will, will have needed to be replaced once or twice. So we think by you are uberizing this data collection, doing it via mobile devices, which are you know, the number of smartphones now through, throughout all of the countries are working is incredible that we um, very quickly remove the need almost to do this data collection. So we have we have LoRa options, we have GSM options, um, but 90% of, of people are installing, even large utilities are installing actually without cellular modems in the devices, in the smart taps themselves. But it's something to think about. We've, we've, there are options there, but it's um, it's uh, yeah, really, really interesting. Good. So I'm going to go on to some questions in a second. Let's um, let's just uh, talk back about the sustainability top. So I think I think you can see that um, you can use smart taps in really any situation. So this could be any social situation, whether it's local water committee managed, whether it's managed by a national utility, whether it's a county or state uh, organization, it really fits into any social situation. Whether you want to use it as a way of managing free water or whether you want to run a hybrid, free and paid, all of these models fit. We have all of the mechanisms in there for protecting socially vulnerable people. Hopefully in your mind, you can think of just the, the ROI that we were looking at there. The costs for doing this are really quite low. Yeah, we are talking about really low costs for implementing these kind of networks. And the operation and maintenance of them is also low. We are talking about really small amounts of money when you start to think about it over weeks and months um, of, of the revenue that you can collect. The product's built to be really simple to install and service and built to be robust. So again, people are saying, why is it not in a armored steel cabinet, etc.? Actually, it's designed to a cost point. It's designed to be super robust. So this polycarbonate case we're using, you know, you can really take a hammer to. It's built, built for the environment it's in. But we've also done it on one hand. We're thinking, how can we make this transportable? How can we make it... Um, yeah, scalable. If we if we're building a twenty thousand dollar steel cased, um, basically ATM, people will still break into it if they really want to, and it becomes unaffordable and not scalable. So we think we've got a really good um, mixture between simple, robust, uh, affordable, and scalable. And of course, we have two points: is it's a solar powered device, means it's easy to deploy, means it's environmentally friendly. And really importantly, we are making sure that people value water, you know, this this great, great and precious resource we have, that they value it and use it wisely by avoiding waste. So good, slightly longer than I, I, I wanted to go there, but um, I'm open now to questions. We've got lots of uh, questions to go back through. Um, 
Good. So let's um, let me talk two th two questions that are, maybe we can link together. Actually, um, one question was how do people know how much water they have on their token? So if you look at this picture here, what you can see is when you come up to a dispenser and tap the dispenser, you can go to any dispenser and tap it. You, the first thing it will tell you is how much credit you've got. So this this on the screen here, it actually tells me I've got 901 liters and nine tenths of a liter. So the little dots next to the one are telling me I've got nine tenths. So as I tap tap my tag on the any dispenser, it will tell me how much credit I've got. If I hold the tag, and again, please look at the videos, you'll see this in operation. Um, it's much easier than trying to describe it from a slide. Um, if I hold the tag there, it starts to dispense water. And it will actually count down in 0.1 litres. So you can have basically a collector cup full. You don't have to collect a jerry can, you can collect a cup or a water bottle or a bucket or a jerry can. You can just collect as much water as you want. Think of it like using a a pump at a gas station when you hold your finger on the trigger water comes out take it away it stops so this is exactly the same mechanism so you can always see on the display here how much credit you've got available um, if you've got uh, free credit it will also tell you how much free water you've got available today and how much you've got in your paid for wallet so both of these are both of these are in there um, the other point on usage yeah was can the tags work at any dispenser so what we what we what we do um in the back end is we we, we can define either that tags can work across all dispensers maybe we'll give one example let me give a real example here because it will be easy to understand so we have um one customer who is a uh, working at a national level in in a country and they have 10 regions and they really have had a choice when we um, set the system up and it can be changed at any time but obviously good to plan these things if you can um, we said look you can do this in lots of ways you could either say you can roam to any dispenser in the country and collect water is one option second option you could go to any dispenser in a region and collect water or the third is you can keep people to their own communities. And again, you can do hybrids of these two communities can work together, these don't. But simply, if you think about it, you can you can set in the system who can get um, whose tags work on which dispensers. So by default, I think it would make sense that everybody can use the dispensers in one community. If maybe there's a neighboring community that uh, you know it is half a kilometer away, maybe it makes sense that people can can collect from both. Um, as long as the tariffing's roughly the same, then this is fine. You don't want people charging their token in one tariff and then going to another. This doesn't make sense. But you, we can set in the system who can and who can't roam with their tags, um, which networks they can go to, which they can't go to. Um, Yeah, so um, by default, and when we designed the system, we built this more flexibly. But the question here is, um, do credits um, equal liters? And the simple answer is, yes, they do. The system's actually capable of, of doing credits mean different things like buckets or gallons or cups or whatever. But actually, what we what we found out through all the deployments it's so much better to keep one credit equaling one liter. This just makes everything so much simpler. So what in this case, it says I've got 901 credits, which is 901 liters. And what we've just implemented in the SmartTap app actually is, and this is really for the, the end customers, when they go to buy their credit, let's just say they have a, a number of shillings or cities or whatever local currency they're using there's a little calculator that they're in there that shows them if you pay 10 shillings you will get x credits equals x liters and even x jerry cans so there's a little calculator that shows them exactly what they're getting almost like a currency conversion where you do currency to 
two system credits, which equals liters. So we found this is really this has really helped people to understand um, that they're getting the right amount and they're not cheated. Again, part of the implementation of the networks is normally some posters that explain to people you, you're going to be paying, you're going to get 10 jerry cans per 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 shilling or whatever the, the the going rate is. So the the rates of water pricing is typically published around the community. So um, we have um, lots of questions here. Let me try and go. Yeah. So what's the purpose of the hub? In so um, you'll see on some of the documentation uh, where we use a hub. So where we're using a hub, this is for LoRa, a LoRa gateway. So L O R A, L O R A, um, low power, long range um, radio. This is uh, uh, for data collection. Um, as I mentioned, this is really not not used so often. So the the hub is only about collecting operational data. Um, most people are running offline taps with um, localized data collection via smartphone. Again, this is um, m much simpler and obviously cheaper. So this is this is really uh, the way most people are going. Um, yeah, lots of questions about robustness. So, you know, this is, is this plastic thing really strong? Um, I'll also uh, link onto PartnerNet. There's a, a, a good video of taking really uh, lo lots of different tools um, to the device to show you it's strong. So we've driven over the um, device with, with, with a Land Cruiser. Um, we've been hitting it with big sledgehammers. So, you know, hammer. Uh, the size of your arm, hitting it with a hammer like this, hitting it with big wrenches, these kind of things. I think when we think about security of a device like this, let, let's think about the reality of it. We can secure the thing to a level. Um, we want to make it robust in use, of course. But if we think about how we secure it, um, there is always a simple a simple way of getting around these systems which is you dig and find the pipe and put a connection in and that's what you know the the, the way you can get around all of these devices so we can really build a uh, super strong jail like div, um, housing for the device typically it adds cost and complexity and doesn't really make it any more secure so you'll see some examples um, on our website and you'll see some examples where locally people are again i think often really more for um more, more for the purchaser being happy of putting uh, extra pieces of steel boxes around things um actually it often just makes the thing more difficult to use and doesn't make them any more secure um so yeah sec security i would say is always a trade off between user friendliness and how much you want to spend on securing something same same debate with solar panels yeah you can spend a lot of money on securing them but actually often this is wasted money because if you put them near people if people value the service if the community if it's a community facility these things tend to get looked after we have really extreme i can't in fact i'm going to say no no thefts or vandalisms um that's not absolutely true we have had a couple of module thefts um but increasing the length of the, the pole and moving the the units has, has fixed that problem if things are um very public if they are a, commun a valued community resource then they tend to be looked after there are um idea people have some ideas of uh putting them in uh yeah, put, putting them in extra cases, but I, my, my personal opinion is it doesn't really help. We have, of course, got security screws. No security screw is uh, fail proof, but it's just uh, avoids casual tampering here. What's really important on these solutions is your digital security. So people kind of are very worried about, oh, we, we must put it in a metal box. Um, firstly, the metal is weaker than the polycarbonate we're using. But also then they don't worry about the uh, they don't think about the digital security so what's really important for me in these systems is that you have 
very strong digital security. And what I mean by this is that you can't hack the system. You can't copy the tags. You can't take the tags and add credit to them. And we saw this very early on um, by some of the competitor systems out there are using uh, technology that that was hacked three or four years ago. So really hacked a long time ago. And it means you can load up one token and then duplicate it and sell it to your friends. You can actually add your own credits at home, for instance, by using fairly simple uh, and well-known um, hacks available on YouTube. On our solution, we are super secure. So we're using, and this is why our tags are a bit more expensive, because we're using the, the highest security possible. If you think about digital security, it becomes more important. If you if you deploy, let's say you dis deployed 10,000 smart taps across, across the country, if someone hacks the way to replicate a tag, that means you not only have to replace every tag in the country, which would be millions, it also means you have to go and change the technology in every dispenser. And this is why, you know, choosing the right um, technology in the beginning is very important. OK, yes, it might cost you a bit more money in the beginning, but it's far cheaper than having to go and retrofit it in a year's time because it's hacked. If you've got five in a remote area, they probably won't be hacked. Once you've got the scale of solutions, then they're targets for hackers. We, of course, know we have some of the best hackers in the world now in sub-Saharan Africa. This is a... Uh, the Russians are out of this now. This is some fantastically creative minds that can hack anything across Africa. So we should, uh, so we should uh, think about that. So we can, um, we can, of course, see all of the data um, from the cloud. Uh, all the transaction data is is live on online. You can see all of the sales of credits that are made, um, and then. In terms of the technical data from the product, so how are they doing? How much did they dispense today? What were the queuing times like? All of this information can either be collected um, from the device offline, if you like, at the end of the day, end of the week, every hour using a smartphone. And this is all available then on, on, on the uh, global, on the Lawrence Global system. So you can see all of the data, you can see which ones are performing, which ones are too busy, um, what's going on. And of course, you can also um, connect them live if you want to. Um, and you'll see more information about a couple of options to do that in the next uh, the next week. So there's a couple of routes to do that, either via the hubs or via GSM. But again, I would please get you to think about how useful live data from each dispenser is because uh, what's really important is you know how much money how what the financial transactions are the operational data to say five people have visited this morning is not so interesting the other thing to think about is where you have a service problem with a unit so it's it's got an error um, of course they're monitoring themselves um, they calibrate themselves they do all of these things they're autonomous if they have a problem someone in the community tells you instantly so the idea of it it being remote remote monitored um it pops up on the screen please call this number if there's a problem um so you 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 can uh, you find the community tell you very quickly if there's a problem remote management and monitoring then becomes yeah slightly less useful but we can do both um Yeah, so power and can we power it from an external power source? So we said we have um, we have by default the battery in, inside, which gives the unit uh, three days autonomy. So it would operate at full capacity for three days, um, dispensing water without. If its solar panel was not there, it would it would be doing that um, using the battery. If you want to connect it to the grid, um, yes, you can. You would just bring in. Um, a 20 up to 24 volt um, DC power into it so from a you know plug top power supply this kind of thing up to 24 volts and connect that instead of solar so you would connect that into the unit instead of solar uh, that would also then charge the battery so 
even with weak grid situations you can you can run it um from grid power but we we want 24 volts dc max in there so the options are there to do both again of course it makes sense that we run it uh, on solar power if we can that's what it's designed to do um Yeah, so again, more. I'll just maybe clarify some more questions about the um, can you use a tag here and take it there? So what, what we basically do, if I try and explain this again, you can decide whether tags can go from one system to another or not. So if we if we define one group of dispensers, maybe it's 20 in a community, we can say whether the tags for this community can go outside of this group or not. Or we can say it goes from this group to this group and this group, but no further. So all the time we can decide and define which tags can go and use which dispensers. So this is very flexible in how it works. Um, so you don't need to worry about someone sending a tag to their relative at the other end of the country um, who, because they get a cheaper rate and sending it around. You can define exactly which tags work with which dispensers. So the, the back-end security of this is very smart. It allows for lots of different profiles to be held on the tag, who can do what, and lots of profiles are held in the dispenser on who can do what. And this is all, all, all secured, of course. Good, so I realize we are um, 10 minutes over time. Um, I hope you found that useful today. Um, just trying to, we've got some more, um, Uh, lots some more quizzes okay some questions here I'll follow up directly or get our channel managers team to um, to follow up with you some of the questions if you have more questions please feel free to email them through to me um, and I'll pass them out to the team uh, who looks after your your region so if you could just tell me where you are if you're sending an email through so I, I can either answer directly or pass it into the team um, we've got lots of uh, yeah, lots more information on our website, lots more information on PartnerNet around the smart taps, and all of our channel managers are are there to help you um, with your next project. So if you've got, got some ideas um, of projects that you're ready to deploy, um, yeah, we're, we're excited to help you through those. There's, we can share, share lots more information with you of experience with, we've gained elsewhere. So I think one of the, the useful things about us being a global organization is we are really gaining experience from lots of customers and we're really offer, uh, able to offer now and share advice of things that have worked and just as importantly, things that haven't worked in other countries. So, you know, hopefully that will stop us repeating some errors and hopefully then we, we also share on those those successes too. So thanks for attending today. You'll get your um, uh, a link for the recording of today's webinar and um, we've got a couple more coming next week i hope to see you on those thanks very much <laughs>